Welcome to the online lecture notes for Connorland Howo and Wap dealing with the medieval church in Middle Ages Europe. So the first thing we're going to talk about is kind of a broad overview of the powers of the church and how influential they were in people's lives. Like I cannot overstate uh, how important or how unifying the church was to people in a time when there's not a lot of unification going on. Like I always use the term life is cheap back then. Lifetimes were short. It was very dangerous. You could die at any point from uh, famine, from invasion, from a wide variety of things. So within that, people needed some kind of sense of security, kind of, some kind of sense of stability. And for the most part, the church during this time uh, in Europe provided that. Uh, so along with that, they also had broad and sweeping powers. Uh, the first and foremost was political. They were the most influential, um, powerful people in whatever kingdom, whatever area you're talking about when it came to influence and power over kings. All right, So they played into policy. They influenced kings and queens in ways that was impossible for other people to do during this time. Also, when it came to the economic power, they were one of the largest landowners uh, in Europe at this time. And from, if you recall from our uh, conversation on feudalism and manorialism, land equaled power and land equaled wealth back there. So when you combine all these things together, it's pretty obvious to see how powerful the church was um, during the time period that we're talking about. So the first thing we're going to do before we actually get to how the church worked is how was the church set up? In other words, like what were the different levels within the church hierarchy? And at the bottom of the totem pole, which is a bad term to use, but it was the parish priest. He was the guy who worked day to day with people. He was the guy that was in the village, in the town, in the city, whatever it was, who um, directly served the people. So as far as the, the basic responsibilities and duties of the parish parish priest, um, there were several things that they were kind of in charge of. Uh, first of all, and this is the main term of it, and everything else kind of falls from that. I didn't indent on it. But it dealt with sacraments, which are ceremonies in which you got God's grace. And these things consisted of, of things as following. Uh, first of all, baptisms, when a child's born to bring them into the church, and all those kind of things. Uh, number two, penance, which is kind of the punishments you receive for your sins. When people went to confession, they would give them penance or what they were required to do to atone for their sins. And number three, last rites, uh, which is kind of the cleansing of the soul, confession, whatever you want to call it, uh, before someone passes away to ensure that they make it to heaven. Next, we're going to go up a level and look at bishops. Now, bishops were the people who managed the diocese or a group of parishes, or if you want to look at it this way, uh, the groups of congregations who were in whatever district they were over. You can see a district map of England today uh, on the picture on the left. Uh, these guys were normally feudal lords, all right, which means they owned a lot of land, which means they were relatively powerful. Um, and they, like everybody else through feudalism, had vassals who were underneath them. Uh, speaking of the diocese, going back to that for a second, uh, normally the center of the district for the bishop was a cathedral, which we looked at in class today, and uh, uh, we'll look at a little bit more going forward. But that was kind of like the um, the center of the of the bishop's um, group, of his district, if you want to call it like that. As far as the roles of what a bishop did, look, they didn't do a whole lot different on a day-to-day -day basis than a parish priest did. They just did it on a larger scale. Uh, as well as those responsibilities, they were also... Uh, in charge of doing things like settling disputes or cr controlling finances and assigning clergy to churches. So they were kind of like the managers of a group, of, a group of parishes, if you want to look at it like that. At the very top is the Pope, who is the supreme authority and the spiritual leader of the church at this time, and even today with the Catholic Church. Uh, some of the things that they do, he handles matters of doctrine. He kind of sets the tone and the direction for the entire church with policy, with doctrine, with whatever you want to call it. Uh, he did have help in this. It wasn't a one-man job. He would normally be advised by a group of cardinals, which was another level on the hierarchy, uh, called the Curia. And they would kind of just help him out with any dilemmas or any problems that he had. Next on the list are monks and nuns. Now, these guys weren't officially uh, a part of the official structure of the church, but they were uh, people who served an important purpose as far as reaching people, spreading the message, and helping people out during this time. Uh, monks and nuns were people who felt like um, to get close to God, they had to withdraw from society, and they had to avoid the temptations of the world in order, in order to stay pure and have a, a closer, more pure relationship with God. So as far as the lifestyles of monks and nuns, I mean, they had a pretty regimented day and a very scheduled day, as you saw in that document that we looked at in class. Uh, as far as some of their activities that they participated in to try to become closer to God, obviously they spent a lot of time praying. Um, they also spent a good amount of time fasting or not eating in a way to purify their body and become close to God. And also, going back to what we talked about a while ago, 
self-denial, okay, to try to purify themselves and not give in to temptation as much as possible. As far as where they lived, uh, groups of monks uh, lived in buildings called monasteries, ab uh, nuns lived in buildings called abbeys, which were more or less complex, as you can see a picture of a monastery right here, and it was basically self-sufficient. They had everything they needed to get through daily life, as far as food production, uh, clothing production, all the things that went into uh, life at this time, you could pretty much produce within these um, complexes. As far as one of the main responsibilities for monks during this time, um, they spent a lot of time in a scriptorium, which was the room in which they copied down manuscripts, particularly Bibles. And they did this by hand. There's no printing press. There's no printers back then. So if something was going to be mass produced, it had to be done by hand. It took a lot of time, very intricate, very detailed work. Uh, one of the key features of the manuscripts that came out of these monasteries uh, is the illumination of them. Now, if you remember from class, when you look at an illuminated manuscript, there's a couple of characteristics that make it unique. First of all, there's going to be a large letter that starts off every page, and also it's going to be colorful and it's going to have illustrations around the border or sometimes within the script itself. Now, remember, you might see these at some point, so you at least need to be aware of, uh, of what an illuminated manuscript looks like. Next on our list is the spread of monasticism, uh, which was done by missionaries. Um, as you recall, these are people who go out in the world and try to convert people over to Christianity. And these people were sent to some of the f most far-off places uh, in the known world at this time in an effort to bring the quote-unquote uncivilized and barbarian into the light of Christ and have them join uh, in the church. One of the most popular missionaries who is uh, kind of, I guess, stayed with us throughout history and is in fact a saint today is St. Patrick. Uh, just a little background on him. Uh, he was known as the Apostle of Ireland. He was born in Scotland. He was captured by a raiding party when he was 14, and he was forced to go to Ireland and become a shepherd. And while he was there, uh, God spoke to him and told him that he must escape and he must find his way home, and that's what he did after a couple of failed attempts. Well, he goes back to Scotland and settles back into life after he's reunited with his family, and eventually he starts to hear the call, as they call it. Um, and he goes into the, to, to the priesthood. And as he does, he starts to feel like a longing and a yearning to go back to Ireland and convert these people and bring them into the fold of Christianity, and that's what he does. Uh, so he leaves, he goes to Ireland, and uh, he converts an incredible amount of people over to Christianity to the point where Ireland is a predominantly Catholic uh, nation to this day. Next on our list is the political life of the church, or how it played into political life. And the most important way that it did is that the church had its own set of laws. Back during this time period in Europe, there were two different sets of laws. You had the king's laws, or the law of the kingdom, and you had the canon law, which was the law of the church. For that reason, any crime that was committed by a priest or a bishop or whoever it was, anybody associated with the church, they would be tried in church court. They would not be have to go through the king's justice or anything like that. So for that reason, there were some differences between punishments uh, for the same crimes committed by a member of the clergy versus a member uh, of regular society. Uh, the church had a couple of powerful tools at its, at its disposable, disposal to kind of keep people in line. The first of which was excommunication, which basically means uh, if someone does something against church teaching, you can kick them out of the church. They're not allowed to participate in services, which means they're not allowed to go to heaven. Uh, this was a huge fear of people at this time. They put up with the crappiness on earth so they could get to heaven. So to have this threat over, and it, over them, it kind of kept them in line. Also, the church could expand it out and actually forbid an entire region or country or kingdom or whatever it is from participating in church services as well. And it was a good way to kind of keep kings and queens and people in line as well because they didn't want to have to deal with their people uh, if they weren't allowed to, to go to heaven. There would be a threat of rebellion, revolution, whatever you want to call it, out of fear of not being able to go to the afterlife. Next, we move on to medieval art and how it kind of applies to the church. And it does in the fact that a majority of paintings and a majority of the artworks that come out during the Middle Ages in Europe have to do with some kind of, of religious aspect. In other words, a lot of them are to serve the glory of God. And you see that represented uh, in a variety of ways in paintings and in sculpture and whatever it is. Be it through angels, depictions of the afterlife, biblical scenes, people being involved in everyday church activities and things like that. And that's what kind of differentiates uh, medieval art from other periods we'll look at, like the Renaissance or Islamic art and things like that. And it's because the church was such an integral and important part of everyday uh, people's everyday life. So real quick, I'm going to go through a couple of examples. I'm not going to describe a whole lot about them because we kind of looked at them in class. But take note of the key themes that we've talked about and how these paintings serve to glorify God and do things like that. You see depictions of angels in a lot of them. It's obviously a biblical scene. 
uh, and all those kind of things. And you'll notice these as you go through and look at these paintings. Another key cultural component that the church played a large role in during the Middle Ages was the architecture of the time period. And uh, the form of architecture for Middle Ages Europe is called Gothic architecture. And if you see any buildings, you need to be able to associate it with that. Uh, a couple of key characteristics of this, one is kind of how it goes vertical. It reaches up to the sky towards heaven because a lot of the buildings that were built in the Gothic architectural style were cathedrals or large churches. Uh, another key component was the flying buttress, which you see right here, and it's the innovation that allowed buildings this large and this vertical to be able to stand up over time. Real quickly, just a couple of examples of Gothic architecture. You've got Chartres Cathedral in France, uh, one of the best-known cathedrals in France uh, even to this day. You've got Cologne Cathedral in Germany. You can get an idea of kind of the, the span of these buildings when you look at it. Obviously, this is from World War II era uh, when they're getting bombed. But even with the architecture and the size of the buildings during then, the, the size of the church overwhelmingly dwarfs anything around it. So you can see how the cathedral was like kind of like the centerpiece of the society, and it was the showpiece for a lot of towns and cities during the Middle Ages. Uh, another component of cathedrals was stained glass, which you even see in some churches today. Normally back during this time, it would depict uh, events from the Bible uh, and things like that. An incredible detail, very vivid, very bright, and uh, things like that. So as you can see here, this is kind of a, a blown up version of the stained glass pictures we just looked at in the last slide. Uh, and it gives you an idea of the detail and the effort and things that went in. And remember, this was all to serve the glory of God, much like the artwork and things like that. So, all right, guys, that wraps up the uh, the lecture notes on the medieval church. Uh, appreciate you listening. Appreciate uh, the work that you're putting in and everything. Just keep doing it. And uh, we'll see you in the next one, which should revolve around the Crusades.